So, um, I hope you're all uh, uh, no longer hungry, um, even though you might be seeing some nice uh, sweets. Um, so, let's continue with today's talk. Um, I will go into uh, native storage integration. What are we doing there and what actually are storage systems? And I hope that I'll be cleaning up some, clearing up some questions. Um, and uh, after that, I will dig into the deployment. <laughs> this, yeah, I, I will go back into the deployment description, some of these microservices. And um, if everything goes well and the stars align correctly, um, I will even be able to show a demo of OCloud 10 running in parallel to OSIS. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, so uh, let's start with the fundamental basic building blocks. So what is uh, is a storage anyway, and what what kind of storage aspects does OnCloud use? Um, why do we even need a database? Um, and why is it all that important? So um, let me take away. Um, I mean, this picture should. Yep, they might look the same, but uh, as you may know, they crunch differently when you bite on them, when you chew on them. So. It's the same with storages. Um, oh, I have the wrong focus. So um, with OnCloud 10, um, we are actually putting, um, and that's literally a, a, um, something that we try to, to um, phrase that way. We are putting a glass pane on top of all the different storages that you may know. Um, so um, we treat every storage the same that is lying uh, underneath own cloud. It doesn't matter if that's an FTP or if that's POSIX or if that's S3 or Dropbox or whatever. Um, but that means that we lose some of the capabilities. Um, own cloud also gives you some capabilities like file uh, individual versions, but um, it also takes away um, certain cap native capabilities like snapshots. Uh, so snapshot snapshots are not exposed in the web UI or by OnCloud at all. Um, we also do not integrate with the OS, so we cannot set ACLs in OnCloud 10, um, or you would have to run a binary and, and allow the process Apache to uh, mess with permissions and then in in, in, um, in person users that is possible with the uh, with the um, Kerberos tokens and 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 there are ways to do that but it's all just a hack and a trade-off that uh, we never really liked to do with own cloud 10 um, so whenever somebody touches the files um, bypassing own cloud 10 we say no she shouldn't do that uh, with OSIS, that'll be different, very different. Um, but um, that'll be a trade-off. We'll go into these things later. Um, the biggest um, requirement that we have is that we can attach arbitrary metadata to files on the disk. Um, so all we want all we beg of anybody that implements a storage provider is let us attach a UUID to a file so that we can actually find it again if somebody moves it uh, without us knowing. Um, but um, that'll give us the really nice capability to really leverage all the different in, uh, aspects of storages that are there. So what are storage aspects? Um, let me start with the, the obvious. Um, so a, hierarch a hierarchical file tree, that would be a nice property. Um, I think you all have seen this. Most people organize their files in a tree. Uh, but what, are, what actually makes up a tree? So um, I hope that now latency is OK. Um, so a tree, uh, in a tree, every resource is identified by a path. So here it's pictures and avatar, slash picture, slash avatar, JPEG is the path to the avatar picture. Um, it always starts at, um, every path starts at the root. 
and um, every path has path segments. So the edges between the nodes in our tree are uh, called path segments. And they are um, separate by uh, different characters depending on um, the file system, op the operating system that you're using. Um, there is also a distinction between files and folds. So they are not, not the same thing um, because uh, folders, are, folders are actually something that you use to um, yeah, group stuff together to make collections of resources. Uh, there is also, I hope I can clear something up for anybody that's had, that has asked himself, hey, what is a, what's the difference between a folder and a directory? A directory is a file system concept and a folder is literally something that you put stuff into. Uh, an example is that if you have a, um, the, these most uh, recent or recently used files, that is not a directory. That's not something that, that physically exists on, or yeah, that digitally exists on any storage. That is a virtual folder. Um, so if you ever ask yourself, what's a, what's a folder and what is a directory? A directory, that's something file systems have. Um, now, the biggest property, as I mentioned, um, or the most important aspect is that we can put arbitrary metadata to it. And that's why um, we need that to identify files. In OCloud 10, we use the database. That's the whole point why we have a database in OCloud 10. Um, we attach a file ID to files in the storage because we want to attach more data to it, like share information, uh, comments, tags. Um, and uh, it's quite important that this uh, metadata is not lost when you move files around. So in OCloud uh, 10, you know, there is this uh, FTP storage and um, that is the most, or any storage that uses uh, FTP or FTPS or SSHFS, that's the most brittle one because we cannot persist anything there. And uh, if somebody changes something on the other end of the line, we don't get a notification, nothing. We would have to literally crawl all the storage. So uh, that will not go away, but now we can actually um, put stuff back into the storage to make these things work. There are different ways of attaching metadata to, to files. I mean, uh, POSIX has extended attributes. Uh, there are also alternate data streams for people who know about Windows. Um, and, and you open them with an really like F open, which is weird, but it works. Uh, Explorer uses that to attach the URL from uh, the domain or the, the file and where you downloaded a file from. So if, you have, if you're running Windows, you can actually check that. Uh, also, S3 has object metadata, which we can also use to attach arbitrary metadata. Um, the most important thing is that we can actually persist the metadata that we want to assign um, with the storage system because that allows us to give uh, to gain atomic backups. Um, remember that there's by design, you, you don't need a database. Um, and that means that if you want to back up a um, user's storage space, a user's home, or deprovision it, you can just archive that on block and restore it on block. So that's the whole idea. No longer, you know, trying to mess with the data, with the large tables in the database. Um, speaking of persistent identifiers, um, in POSIX file systems, you usually have a, an inode that identifies a file in a file system or, or in, a, in a mount. Uh, in a mount. Um, but the inodes are not something that we can just use to, uh, to uniquely identify files. Um, first of all, they get reused. So when you delete a file, um, the inode becomes free. The number, it's a number, it becomes free again and the file system may reassign it. Uh, in GPFS or spectrum scale, you can actually disable that. Um, but uh, they also have other problems. They have, 
even more. So if you restore something from um, from a backup, the inodes will differ. That means that if you if you were relying on a file ID lookup based on the inode, now all the lookups are broken, or you need to rebuild that index. Um, so that's also not really a nice property of inodes. Um, and furthermore, um, something that the iOS developers uh, came up with or asked us, hey, can we assign a file identifier whenever we create a new file or create a folder? Because um, when they run stuff, uh, they have to delegate stuff to background processes. Um, and these background processes cannot start too often and they cannot make too many requests again and again. Uh, all in background, um, they would get penalties uh, by the operating system. So that's why they were asking, hey, can't we just you know, send metadata along with the uploads so that we can identify the file afterwards, which is a file identifier. So the best way really is to assign an arbitrary uh, UUID attribute or that, um, yeah, we recommend a UUID because then that'll be collision-free when you merge storage spaces. But uh, for migration purposes, that might also be the existing file ID from on Cloud 10 prefixed with an, uh, an instance ID or something. Um, so we really need identifiers. But not only do we need to store them, um, we also need to be able to look them up efficiently. Um, because uh, if you are accessing a share, we need to be able to find the file that was sh that you were that you're trying to access. And in the share metadata, that is persist that there is only a file ID or a resource ID. Um, and the question is, how can you quickly look that up? Basically, there is no way to do that in a O um, one manner unless the storage system itself has um, identifiers that are not inodes and that it can look up efficiently. I only know of one of one storage system that does that, and that's EOS, <laughs> because they built it for own cloud <laughs> um, already years ago. Um, so there are file systems that have userland tools. So XFS, uh, you can use XFS uh, uh, debug, DB, XFS DB, XFS underscore DB. And then you need to uh, um, look up the inode and then you get, uh, you can get the path to that. So um, all you want is to, to somehow get to the data and find the actual file name. So you can look up a file by ID um, using the inode, which is commonly done using find, but that's super slow. And the other tools may have better way, other file system specific tools may have better ways to do that. Um, BetaFS also has a way to do that. And well, XFS, I mentioned XFSDB. Um, OpenBSD has FFA. Um, and it also has a has a mechanism to do that. Um, but ultimately, you can always add that using a key value store. Um, because it's the naive way would be to say, OK, I'll just have a user ID uh, mapped to the path. But that'll be very inefficient when, or that will lead to lots of writes when you rename a folder. Um, because all the children of the folder have to be renamed. Um, but that's a topic that comes later. I won't run ahead. Um, let's say it's good enough that you, you can, you should, if you want to use a key value store, you should use a UUID to parent and name uh, lookup. Uh, that'll require you to do multiple reads, but they scale better than having to update and write thousands of keys just because somebody renames a folder. Uh, we'll get to that again. So um, the second most important property is that, I mean, the whole point of OnCloud is to have a desktop client or mobile clients that get notified when something changes and that sync changes to the different devices. Um, and the desktop client uses the etech um, to discover um, changes in the tree. It starts polling, uh, it currently polls the root 
of a storage space or of your home. Um, and it will uh, detect if the e-tag changes and then recursively descend comparing the e-tags uh, to find the leaves that actually changed and download them or upload to whatever it needs to upload. Um, this is called state-based sync. Um, and anything yet that you may run into, like, oh, uh, what about delta-based sync or delta sync um, or change-based sync? Um, those are optimizations on top of that. Um, so yes, currently we have to uh, traverse the tree, which is okay. Um, it is a little bit faster ju to just ask the client, hey, what's the list of files that changed since uh, last time I asked you? Um, but it's really just a different way of asking and, and discovering changes. Um, and ultimately, you don't need you don't want to keep track of all the changes for every client and where he is on the server side, because uh, after thirty days, you're just going to say, "Okay, you know what? You just have to do a full discovery again anyway." So then you're back to state based. Uh, and the last one, like push based uh, or uh, yeah, push based mechanisms, um, the server could um, talk to clients if they are connected and tell them what changed the moment it changes. Um, that's possible, and we'll get there. Uh, but uh, it's only those are only just uh, optimizations and then yeah performance improvements. Um, for us, it's important that we have an e tech. You always need that. Um, and in on cloud ten, we're abusing the modification time um, because when a file changes in a leaf changes, we propagate the modification time up and update the e tech accordingly um that works but um yeah it's costly because it needs to update uh, all the resources in the path to the root that's also why sharding um the storage space the database um into multiple storage providers uh will get rid of certain bottlenecks of the root folder. So in OnCloud 10, if you remember, your home folder is a virtual view over all the storage providers that you have access to. That means that the storage, the server side has to assemble an e-tag for the root. Otherwise, the desktop client will not be able to pick up changes anywhere in the uh, storage spaces that you have access to. By taking that apart, we allow the desktop client to take that role and only sync what is necessary. And we no longer have this uh, hotspot on the server side. Um, just a pro tip, do not add the e-tag when calculate, uh, do not add the inode when calculating e-tags because it will change when restoring from backup, causing all your clients to resync. So, um, but, I mean, recursive change time is something that um, that actually exists out there. So it's not only EOS this time. Uh, also, CFFS has a recursive change time. And I hope uh, that I get some more info about GlusterFS uh, later in the talk or in the Q&A round. Um, but uh, we'll get, yeah. So if the storage has it, it's always great. Um, we can implement it using the kernel audit lock. That'll grab every change on a certain path or on a certain tree. Um, that's a way to detect changes when you are um, um, when people bypass the OSIS or um, and and you know want to log in via SSH and work on NF on an NFS share. We can then monitor that and assign or update the recursive change time manually. Um, if operating system integration or native file system integration is not uh, important, then we can just propagate the e-time ourselves. So OSIS, if all the requests uh, go to uh, go through OSIS, we can just update the recursive change time and the e-tech accordingly. Um, and then we are on the safe side and clients can always pick up changes. Um, pro tip. Uh, why did I mention the Linux kernel audit? Because it's super awesome. And I notify doesn't scale very well. If you really have a lot of directories, uh, that'll eat your memory. So 
um, it's way, way more efficient to use the kernel out of there, which is specifically built for this kind of monitoring. Um, we also have federated sharing. And in federated sharing, we are using, yeah, we are misusing the M time again. So get last modified is the is the eat, uh, the web app property for the modification time. And that is um, why we can't detect changes in remote instances. Um, it might make more sense to, in the future, also expose a recursive change time as a property. Okay, um, similar to the recursive tree, uh, change time, we have a tree size. Um, you know, if you set a quota on a storage space or on a user home or on an, any folder and you want uh, the storage to um, acknowledge that, um, it has to keep track of the amount of bytes that are been beneath a tree. Um, EOS uses the tree size property for that. CFFS has uh, R bytes. Um, so file systems do that. And if you can, if, if they do support quota, uh, there should be a way to fetch that from the operating system, from the file system. Um, it's not used for sync. Uh, it's, it's you know just for convenience, so that in the web UI you can see, oh, this directory has such and such, such, and such many bytes. Um, but uh, we can actually disable that for if you want to, if you want to have a super performant um, storage, you can actually disable that and not deal with it. Uh, so if you are for performance, that's possible. Uh, it's a trade-off, um, as many other things, um, and um, some storages support it, some don't, and then we have to manually add it on top of it. <clears throat> so back to the topic of renaming. Um, renaming uh, sounds very innocent, but if you are using, uh, if you put your files on an S3 with a path as the key, then you cannot rename. Uh, S3 only supports copy and delete, uh, which becomes annoying if you um, are trying to rename a large folder, like your pictures folder with of the last year. Um, that might eat your data because it runs into timeouts or whatnot. And with OnCloud 10 and the database, that might run into timeouts when talking to the database or the storage, and then you don't know where you end up. Um, this, that you see a folder structure when browsing S3, that's just a hack. Never forget that it's a key value store. And the way it's supposed to be used is to keep the blobs in S3 and keep the metadata in another place. Um, right. Uh, so the, um, the, the, thing that you might trip around, uh, over is that okay then i'll just do don't won't allow uh, renames but very often renames are impl uh, very often delete operations are implemented as a rename operation because you're moving stuff into a trash folder or something that'll bite you when you try to do that on an s3 because it's really it's that's unusable for large folders um so the um, yeah, that's why I'm I'm, I'm using this here. Um, not every storage can 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 do renames. For us, there might also be archives where you can't rename stuff, and ultimately this needs to be reflected by the permissions in the web UI. But uh, yeah. So grant persistence. Grant is a terminology term from the S3 from the CS3 API. The CS3 API. Um, which is um, intended to um, capture the idea, the sharing intent of a user. In um, in the CS3 API, we have share managers for user uh, users and 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 collaboration. Um, we have share managers for public links, and we have share managers for Open Cloud Mesh. And each of them can deal with grants and you know it's, it's, it's intended to capture the idea okay so i want to share this folder with that person with a password and only for two weeks something like that um i don't know of any storage system that allows attaching password protection and um uh, and expiry to shares uh, but 
if it's in the share manager, we can always run uh, background jobs to um, clean them up. Um, the current way in OSIS, uh, when you set a share, uh, it'll persi be persisted in the share manager and the request will be forwarded to the storage provider. And that, has, that can then optionally uh, persist this share information as good as possible. For example, it can set an ACL. If it has the permission to set ACLs via um, the right capabilities set on the executable, yada, 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 the right user is doing that. It's now possible, way easier um, and, and you know, in, uh, in, the, in a correct way that how you would do that. Um, picking up changes from the storage, so read if somebody bypasses own cloud and then sets some kind of ACL, might not always give you back the intent that you wanted. So it's not, that might be complicated. So currently we only support a subset of all the rich ACLs. And um, I think the only one that we also support, the there's one negative ACL to support this birthday scenario where you say, I want to share with this group, but not that user. You can exempt users from a group share. That is uh, coming. Um, and yeah, depending on the storage technology that's that's used them. I mean, I know that S3 has uh, policies, uh, but the storage, storage driver, which actually the implements access to an underlying storage system, uh, decides on the mapping if he maps anything or um, how he maps it. So there will be trade-offs and there will be learnings in, in, in that um, domain, I bet. And that's super interesting. Um, similar to grants, there's also trash persistence. Uh, again, there are multiple ways how you can um, persist um, trash. Let's wait for the slides. Um, Aaron, the POSIX file systems, no POSIX file system has a trash. All they do is they support the free desktop org specification for trash. Um, but uh, you really want to avoid thousands of calls to your support. Hey, I lost my files. Can you please restore them? So that's why OnCloud has a trash functionality and every file you delete lands in the trash. Um, how that is implemented, again, is a trade-off. I mean, you could just flag it as deleted in, in, in the metadata. That would be OK if nobody bypasses OnCloud. Um, you could use, um, you could implement the uh, free desktop org files uh, trash specification and move it into a trash folder um, which actually very which actually aligns very much with the space concept because the trash specification also says okay so your home folder the user's personal files that has a capital t trash folder you know depending on the language it could be named differently um, and if you have like USB drives or other drives, the admin can create a dot trash folder where everybody that has access to that um, to that partition or that folder, that tree, um, must have also uh, permission to access so that they can, when they delete stuff, it can land in that folder. Um, so the, specific, the trash specification has some really nice ideas how to have a trash that is uh, distributed over all the different storage spaces that you have access to. And um, um, yeah, it really depends on what you want to do. The decomposed FS that we have with uh, in, in own cloud uh, in OSIS um, just renames the files and puts a T and then a date so that you can see, okay, this node has been trashed and at a certain time. And that's the path where it was trashed in the metadata. So you can always uh, recover it. Um, the OCloud 10 will restore versions when you undelete a file. Uh, just keep that in mind as a requirement. Uh, the versions persistence, uh, you know, similar. Uh, this is really interesting uh, to grants, trash. Uh, OCloud keeps track of versions. Every file that you upload is just a version, it just creates a new version. 
that works so nice because own cloud uh, uses the um, web dev api and only really has to deal with complete uploads we rarely have to deal with uh, people that are changing a few bytes of a uh, virtual machine actually we have to do that but we don't um so there is the uh, there was this delta sync capability but that's not a use case that we really strongly focus on um and uh, we should probably give a talk on tus <laughs> at some point because that's the upload uh, protocol that we're using that could be extended to support you know ranged put request um we are already um using we are implementing versions in the decomposed file of us like in own cloud 10 so um or in cloud classic so you, when you use the decomposed file fs files will just be a version as as an cloud 10 but if you use a different stack storage technology like uh, um, a normal POSIX file system they don't have versions yet nada nothing um if you do that through cloud 10 um or if you if you access the storage through osis we can keep track of versions yes um but if you now bypass osis if you integrate with the underlying uh, operating system and people can access it via ssh then you don't have versions so keep that in mind um a nice alt so ha huh, fun fact the other files the only file system that i know of that actually supports file versions is windows ntfs ha <laughs> But I think they also do that via a, a service and in additional places. Um, you can do trash and versions with snapshots. Um, so that's how StephFS does it. In StephFS, you can, as an end user, just create a snapshot at any time in, a, in any folder. You just create a dot snap. There's a dot snap folder that you can go into, and then you just give it create a new folder with an arbitrary name that you want and that'll immediately take a snapshot of the tree under the under that folder um so these are the things that we would like to make uh, possible and accessible with uh, osis so you should be able to create just create a snapshot uh, you could make it easier in the ui to say hey uh, this storage supports snapshots oh um that's something that's a storage capability that we can expose um with the new storage space concept. And then Web UI can adapt accordingly and allow users to create a snapshot. Um, or you could script that in, uh, and you know provide daily, monthly, uh, hourly backups. Um, last point is an activity history. Um, you, uh, we saw that in, in the, on the post-its earlier today that um, people want to, um, uh, or people are the, the database table, the OC uh, activity log table is uh, quickly becoming the biggest table in every installation uh, because I have, I have, uh, I need to be careful with my wording uh, because I think the implementation is rubbish and um, I'm happy that we can now do that in a proper way. Uh, to give you an explanation, it, if you share with a group and the group has a thousand users and then you change a file um, in the share with the, the group, that actually creates a thousand entries in the um, activity table because that activity table is also used to check and, and note down who has been notified. There are more elegant ways to do that. Let's put it that way. And uh, that is something that we will uh, focus on after this, because they're really, I mean, this is this journal or this activity history is literally the, the file system journal. What changed on disk when? Um, it would be nice to be able to see who changed it. Um, and for that, we are going to add, uh, as far as I can tell, a callback mechanism from storage providers um that can either be called by the storage providers to um um yeah to collect these kind of events or by um again the linux kernel audit 
um, to send events to this yeah um, event um, source event database. Uh, there is actually ButterFS that has a a sub volume find new that'll give you all the changes since a certain generation ID, which is weird, um, but that works. It obviously requires uh, uh, root permissions, but uh, yeah, so. Um, there are interesting concepts in 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 the wild and different storage systems. Um, you can rebuild the activity history by comparing all the um, change times of all the directories and you know just generating uh, a journal, but that should still be cached. So uh, the activity history is always something that is should just come from a cache. I tried to come up with a small comparison table and um, it, since the question came up, so can we now use cluster of S? I think so, um, but it depends really on how we can implement a, how efficient the ID-based lookup is. Um, so if anybody knows about that, I'm happy to hear about that in the Q&A. And um, yeah, um, any POSIX, so the POSIX storage is really, it really depends on the file systems and what you can do there uh, and on the trade-offs that you want to make, that you're willing to make. Um, so this is really uh, the part that's most exciting. We're currently, we are currently focusing, so the, the OSIS deployment that we have, um, um, so the default OSIS that you start comes with a decompose FS that is a storage provider that works on top of any POSIX storage, but a decomposed in a sense that when you look at the file system, you will only see like a folder nodes and then thousands of symlinks and a folder blobs with uh, the actual blob storage. And that might not be what end users expect if they log in via SSH. So um, that's not what it's meant for. Um, this is meant for a standalone deployment where uh, people do not bypass OSIS. For deployments where you really want to bypass um, OSIS or people where people want to work on the storage system itself, things like CFFS or EOS might make more sense. I don't yet know about ClusterFS. I don't have a strong opinion there. Um, you can use the different kernel mechanisms to um, keep track of the changes and write your own key value store. Um, and that that should work. Yeah. So it's a trade-off. Um, not all storages technologies are created equal, or you can say um, they crunch differently when you chew on them. Um, everything has a trade-off, um, but and yeah, it with OSIS, we can now make different trade-offs than with on cloud classic. That's the cool part. Okay, so much for storages. Um, so let's see, let's dive into, okay, microservices. I mean, there has been this, this change from a monolith to a microservice. Uh, why are we doing that? Um, the main reason is that we saw uh, extensions that would kill the whole instance when they ran wild. Um, so they would, um, you know, uh, run into um, endless loops and eat CPU, or they would eat uh, memory. And so, in order to contain that, uh, a microservice architecture really is is the the stronger. Um, uh, solution uh, because we will be able to focus on the core set on the storage layer um, on the yeah storage platform that and make that rock solid and make everything work there um, where you know if the thumbnailer doesn't work then you don't have thumbnails that's fine we can deal with that uh, but the rest of the system still works you can still um, access your data that's the crucial part and um, so fail grace, fail early, fail gracefully, um, but also um, allow scaling as necessary. Um, 
also with the spaces concept, since we are now sharding on the API level, uh, you can just scale by adding a different, a, a new storage um, storage provider or storage technology, a storage system underneath, and making that accessible um, in the way that best fits it. Uh, Geo replication can now be a feature for certain storage spaces. So you can say, okay, the users uh, are traveling around. They have, uh, they need to have a, a geo-replicated storage, uh, but then there are divisions um, that only have, you know, that only need to work with data in their region. Um, that doesn't need to be geo-replicated. So you you attach um, a storage technology that best fits the use case really. Um, let's talk about this diagram um, because it does capture a few things. So the OSIS binary comes with everything that you see on this slide. Um, it even, well, the storage layer, I expect you to have a file system. That's not, yeah, but we do have a store, a decomposed FS that allows us to implement uh, versioning and trash in an uh, efficient way. Um, and it allows us to use uh, or to implement ID-based lookup without a database because we're using the file system as a key value store, um, which is fast enough because the start calls are cached in memory. So uh, for a normal OSIS deployment, you don't need a database. Um, that being said, there's also a migration um, scenario, which I'll be showing uh, in a moment, um, where you can run OSIS and OnCloud 10 in parallel. Uh, that actually uses the OnCloud 10 database, obviously, but otherwise you would not have the same data. Um, the green block, the identity management, that is something that we uh, are trying to... Um, I'm trying to avoid is not the right thing, but um, we think that our time is uh, is better spent on actual storage and and file sync and share problems and solutions than on identity management, which is uh, why we talked to other um, um, yeah partners and for example to Copano who they have an identity provider which is Copano Connect, and we embed that in um, in OSIS so you. You will get everything out of the binary. You can run it, but if you don't need it, you can just set up Keycloak or Ping Identity and use that as your OpenID Connect provider. Um, the other um, API that we need is the is an API where we can find and list users and groups for uh, sharing. You know, we need to look up share recipients. And the best way to do that still is LDAP but it's configurable. You, I mean, um, Riva does have different user provider backends um, and it's really easy to write another backend there. So that can be very easily adapted to your needs. Um, the whole, um, all services that you see are stateless. So the, starting at the proxy in the beginning here, any request that hits the proxy, uh, and that then makes it um, through the um, through the services. All the services can be scaled um, because they're stateless, with the exemption of services that need to persist data. Aha! Um, but um, the idea there is that you know, for a user's home uh, that tries to persist stuff on a on a disk or in some storage system somewhere. Um, you ultimately need to be able to um, um, have a storage system that is reliable and um, you know can be scaled. So something like Ceph for a cluster file system like EOS or cluster of S. Um, and then you can just run multiple storage providers with the same configuration um, um, on top of that storage. The idea is that a storage provider really sits as close to the storage as possible and maps any metadata and, and uh, storage aspects as good as possible to the underlying storage technology. Um, and then it's about scaling the individual services. So the, the simplest deployment would just have each of these services uh, once 
and if you want to have um, failover uh, then you can just uh, set the stack up twice it'll consume and when the caches are cold it'll consume i think about uh, 120 megabytes of ram and that's it obviously when you have thousands of users that'll increase uh, because uh, user information will be cached um, but um, the cool thing is that since it's a microservice and you can start with you know a redundant um, deployment with just two nodes uh, or pods if you want to call it I bet I'm now mixing up terminology from Kubernetes so please I'm sorry um, you can, just, you can just have two sets of services uh, in a redundant uh, setup. And if you see that, oh, um, I see that the front end, the open, the OC DAF endpoint, this one here, uh, that one is, is really eating all my CPU on that machine, then you can just scale that out. Uh, I bet, so my bet would be that this OC DAF service is the bottleneck because it renders all the XML and it needs to cache um, user information because if you access shares there's also user information attached to that and we cache that um yeah i mean i'm happy to answer questions about any specific services in the q a the idea is that um, with the microservice architecture we can scale as needed and we can scale the services that really need to be scaled um, it, de it also depends on the usage pattern of your users. If all your users are using only Office or Collabora, you know, then you may need to scale those services in a different way. Um, but that'll be a learning curve. And I don't see that as, um, I think that's super interesting, but that's not the technical challenge for OSIS. Um, okay, so parallel deployment. Um, I was talking about it. And um, I will, you know, end in a few seconds and then uh, jump over to Q&A so that we have some time to talk about this. So I will not um, take all the time uh, here in, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, this is really just a slide to let you know, hey, we have a migration concept. Go to own cloud uh, dev slash also slash migration that comes in stages and they are very granular and they have steps that tell you what do you need to do to get the stage how can you verify that it is working um, and that all without breaking your current setup so if you have a test setup you can start today now literally now um and yeah the idea is to run own cloud classic and osis in parallel and um put them behind the osis proxy so now I need to hide some things. So this is my personal instance um, because you know there. Just to show you that there is tons of stuff in here, um, but I can actually say I want to use OSIS. This is uh, setting a proxy currently. Um, I'm doing this manually, and you see that oh, and the notification now already comes and wants to do stuff. So let me go and actually uh, reload the page basically. And now I am in OSIS. Um, and now I can actually browse my current own cloud 10 instance with uh, OSIS. So all the requests here now go through OSIS. So um, if every, anybody tells you, oh, this is vaporware, this isn't working, this doesn't exist, that's just wrong. Um, we've been uh, working on this and I, I literally fixed some, a bug in, in the break <laughs> to allow you uh, so that I could show you this. Um, I'm wondering if I can show you something. So these are my current snapshots. So these are the current uh, images from my phone. And I bet I killed the thumbnailer. Yeah. So I killed the thumbnailer. But anyway, um, this is um, OCL 10. Uh, underneath OSIS with the same database. And now I, I kill the circuit breaker. Great. So this is what you happen when you do a demo. But um, I wanted to just show you that, you know, as a developer, we are already 
working with OSIS on, on our personal instances. At least I am, because it allows me to quickly find things that may not be working correctly yet. Um, the test suite is pretty extensive um, and covers all the things that we have, but uh, exploratory, exploratory, exploratory testing really is currently my personal focus. Okay. Oh, I'm not lost. Where, where am I now? I need to go to the last slide. So yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, you can find me in the Q&A channel now, or uh, you can always find us in the talk OSIS channel. Um, if you want to talk to the developers, to the team, uh, we're really there to, to help you. Um, and we are really eager for your feedback. Let us know what you're doing, how your experiences with OSIS are, um, and get the ball rolling. Thanks, and see you in the QA.